Hello everyone and welcome to lecture three. This lecture will cover the topic of ecology um, on a ba pretty basic level and this is covered in chapters 16 and 17 of your textbook. So let's begin by what is ecology? Ecology is the study of the interactions of organisms with their environment and in their environment uh, it includes both biotic and abiotic factors. And ecology can be studied on various different levels, the levels of the individual, populations, communities, and ecosystems. The type of studied interactions are the interactions of individuals with their environment. However, most of the time, ecology studies um, higher levels of organization than the individual. So we really start looking at ecology, a lot of ecological studies at populations, looking at how populations change over time and their interaction with their environment. Also looking at how different populations of different species interact with one another. And also the interactions between various living organisms and their uh, abiotic environment, so their, their habitat. Okay, so we're going to begin by talking about population growth. So populations grow typically on a logistic curve, follow a logistic curve of growth. And if you've ever taken a microbiology class or know anything about how bacteria grow, you might be familiar with this concept. In logistic growth, there are generally three different phases. The first is the lag phase, and this is characterized by the slow steady growth in a population. So this generally occurs right after you introduce um, a new, uh, introduce a species to an environment. Um, they're growing, they're reproducing, but you're not seeing a huge uh, spike in their density, not quite yet. The lag phase is followed by the log phase. This is where we're seeing exponential growth. So we're starting to see the, the density of the population uh, increase exponentially over time. And this occurs when the conditions are optimum. So it means there's plenty of growth, I mean, plenty of uh, water, plenty of nutrients, plenty of resources, and plenty of space, right? So the organisms will keep growing exponentially until they start to reach their carrying capacity. And the carrying capacity is the maximum density of that population that can be supported in that environment. And it varies per organism. It also varies um, per environment, right? But once we start getting close to the carrying capacity, the population density will, uh, the growth uh, will start to level off. So you can see here that the, if you look at the slopes, for those of you guys who are pretty good with math, if you look at the slope of this curve, this line here, it's pretty steep and it starts to level off. So we're seeing fewer and fewer births, a lot of times when we're starting to see this level off, in addition to births, where fewer births, we're also starting to see emigration. So um, pe the, uh, people in the community, not people, organisms in the community uh, will start to leave the area and uh, because resources are scarce, things are, conditions are getting harder for that organism. And so their growth will start to slow down. This is a typical kind of general growth, but keep in mind that the, the growth of populations across all species of life are not always this smooth, right? There, there are bumps in the road where you might have disease, might knock the population down, or increased predation will knock it down, or then um, all of a sudden there's a flood and there's more water, so you'll see a, a spike in population. But the, this logistic curve is the general curve that most organisms follow when um, growing in, in nature. So there are a couple different types of effects that evolution can have on a population. So we, we, we might be familiar with some organisms that grow very fast, mature very fast, and have a lot of babies. And there are some organisms that grow kind of slow, take a long time to mature, and don't have very many babies. And the, the, both of these types of uh, growth conditions have benefits and drawbacks. Okay, so we're going to take a couple a look at a few of these. So they, we have some animals that have a high mortality rate and a short lifespan. So they must mature early in order to have lots of offspring to pass on their genetic information. Some examples of this, um, as you can see in their image, are like trout or mackerel, like fish. Um, also an example that most of us probably are very familiar with are mice and rats. 
Um, mice and rats, they mature very quickly and they have um, young very quickly and they have many, many young in a very short period of time. And this allows them to pass on their genetic information to offspring before they are consumed. So this is very common in small prey animals um, where your prey, if you don't pass on your genetic information early, then you, your, your fitness is zero and you've lost the game. So this is one type of um, effect that evolution and population kind of relate here. Another type on the opposite extreme are organisms that generally aren't um, subject to predation. So they have long lifespans, a low level of mortality, and they tend to mature a little bit later. So the example that the book uses are giant tortoises. They can live upwards of 150 years. And if you can imagine, there aren't very many organisms that are eating a tortoise. They are very well protected by their shell. Um, another de decent example are humans. Um, we don't um, mature until we're at least over 18, 16, 15, right? Many, many years have passed. Um, and we generally also don't have too many offspring just because we're not being preyed on. We don't have to grow, mature, have offspring very, very early in life because nothing's going to come and eat us generally, <laughs> generally. And then you also have organisms that are somewhere in the middle, right? So these could be um, they're somewhere in the middle. They're not necessarily small prey that they they are being preyed upon very easily, but they're also not um, very immune to predation or being taken out early in life. So they they have somewhere in the middle um, lifespans. They mature kind of somewhere in the middle part of their lifespan, not later and not too early. Um, they sit somewhere in the middle here. And this is all due to natural selection. So as I was trying to indicate when we were talking about the case of mackerel and mice and things like this, this is all via natural selection. So you can imagine if you had um, three types of mice, um, one, mount, one population of mice are, have a trait where it allows them to mature within 10 days and have lots of babies, and another one that allows them to mature in a month and they have a lot of babies, and then one that takes them a year uh, to mature and have babies. Then those, those mice that are able to have babies and mature earlier will likely have more litters, go on to pass off pass on their genes than those that mature later because if you're a mouse you're prey to so many different animals that the one that matures by time of year may not live to a year um, and may not have any type of offspring so um, the this these kind of curves are heavily based in natural selection also any traits that result in sickness or um, death before you're able to pass on your genes, get selected out of the population. Because if you have a gene that causes you to become very sick or die before you can reproduce, then that gene is no longer passed on. But with that being said, any type of trait that affects uh, you after you've reproduced, those tend to linger within the population because by time that uh, that disease or trait has kicked in in later parts of your life, you may have already had offspring who will then have that trait and pass on to their kid and keeps going. Alrighty, so now we've talked about populations and uh, how populations grow and then we've also talked about um, natural selection and populations and how it can affect when an organism matures and um, the different phenotypic traits and um, that, that an organism will have. So now we're gonna move to a slightly larger um, area in the hierarchy, which are communities. So communities are all the populations that interact in a specific area. And so I really enjoy this picture here. This is a image of uh, a watering hole in Africa. And you can see all the various different animals, um, animal species that are interacting in this area. This is a really good um, picture of a very dynamic community. Communities are dynamic and change over time. Um, this can be due to, you know, migration, changes in environmental conditions, and especially after massive events. So if you have a massive geological event, um, 
let's say a monsoon or a volcano eruption or an earthquake, anything like that, major storm can really change the dynamics within a community. One very, very important thing to know about communities, especially in the time that we live in now where you know, humans are drastically changing the environment, are the presence of keystone species. So some communities have um, a very specific species, like one of those species in that community is considered a keystone species. And these are the most crucial species. So all you know, diversity is very, very important. But in the case of a keystone species, if that particular species is removed from that environment, it will drastically change the entire environment altogether. So uh, some of you may be familiar with the uh, sea urchins in, off the Pacific coast. So if you remove the predators of the sea urchin from that area, uh, the sea urchin population gets insane. So there's like otters that will prey on the sea urchins. If all the otters are gone, due to environmental change or due to predation or due to humans killing them off, um, those sea urchins go in insane and they base up, basically eat up all of the kelp in that area. And um, it basically wipes out that whole area and becomes essentially an underwater desert, if you will. So um, in, that, in that kind of example, the otters would be the keystone species. But then the keystone species is not necessarily always a uh, predator. In the book, they also mention a um, um, a grazing animal that um, I think is in the, the U.S. Northwest. And um, if it, if you remove this animal from the environment, one particular type of grass just takes over and chokes out all the other types of grass. But if you reintroduce that grazing animal, it's able to keep that grass under control. And essentially when you remove a keystone species from the environment, you decrease the diversity in that environment and drastically change the dynamics. So these species are the most important in the area. All the species are important. However, these ones are the most important, the most critical. Okay, so moving out even further from populations to communities to an ecosystem. What is an ecosystem? An ecosystem is a group of biotic and abiotic factors that interact. Okay, so this is a, a very, very broad category. And this image here shows you the some of the biotic factors, including like the trees and the fish and the coral. And abiotic factors are like the temperature and the, the water that's there, the elevation, any rocks. Those are uh, abiotic factors. So a biotic components in an ecosystem are called the community, which we just talked about what a community is. And then the abiotic factor components are called its habitat. Some examples that you may be familiar with um, as ecosystems are ponds and forests. And if you believe it or not, also your intestines is a, an ecosystem. And it's funny, you can have what I, what I like to call ecoception. So you can have ecosystems within ecosystems within ecosystems. So if you take, let's say, the human gut, the human gut is an ecosystem within me. And I am in an ecosystem within my community, right, where I actually live. And then this community is like even bigger, right? So you keep building and building there. Now, an ecosystem can be very small or it can be very large, which allows you to have ecosystems that are nested within ecosystems within ecosystems. Biomes are the largest ecosystem, and they're primarily defined by whatever plants and weather occur in that particular area. So this is with the exception of aquatic biomes, which are more defined by things like salinity, water movement, and depth. But for terrestrial environments, um, when you want to differentiate biomes, you look at the plants that are present and the weather conditions. So a, uh, to give you some examples, a desert might have fewer plants. They also might have plants that store water. They might be more rigid, more robust. Um, and then the weather is generally dry, right? And the air is dry, very little moisture. You compare that to a rainforest where we're looking at a lot more plant diversity, um, maybe a lot more flowering plants and things like that. And it's also more wet. That is, there, those are two very different ecosystems. And you can differentiate them relatively easily by the uh, plants and the weather that occur in those two areas.
all life on earth requires energy to survive. And this goes back to the definition, the basic definition of life. You know, you have to replicate, but also you have to undergo metabolism that's based in energy. All energy that is on the planet earth is derived from the sun. And without the sun, life as we know it on this planet would not uh, be what it is today. The interesting thing about it is the sun produces a large quantity of energy, but only 1% of the sun's energy is actually stored and converted into chemical bonds. And this is done via photosynthesis from plants, um, algae, and, and some bacteria. And what plants and algae and bacteria are able to do via photosynthesis is to trap that energy into chemical bonds to make proteins, lipids, polysaccharides, um, that allow, that start kind of like that energy flow within the various uh, populations on Earth. So energy flows through trophic levels, and it starts with the producers. Those are the ones that undergo photosynthesis, what I just talked about, our plants, our base bacteria, and our algae. And then it flows from the producers to the primary consumers, secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers. And we'll talk a little bit more about all four of these next. So at the base of this, this ladder here, we have our producers. And producers are what we just talked about. They're autotrophic. They means that they make their own food. And this is via the process of photosynthesis. And um, like we mentioned, this includes plants, algae, and some photosynthetic bacteria. And um, they are able to use photosynthesis to turn energy from the sun into chemical energy in the form of macromolecules. Pro pro producers are then consumed by primary consumers. And these are herbivores and, and omnivores. And the herbivores will then eat the plants or the bacteria or the algae and um, use that energy that they get from consuming the plants to make their own biomass. This is a form of heterotrophism, which means you need to eat something else in order to get your nutrients, right? So autotrophic, you make your own food. Heterotrophic, you gotta eat something else to get your food. Um, many of these herbivores, these primary, primary consumers, have a symbiotic uh, relationship in their gut with various cellulose metabolizing organisms because plants have cellulose um, and many organisms cannot naturally break that down. So we need some sort of um, microorganism in our gut that will break it down for us. In the case of humans, we unfortunately don't have this, but like cows and um, other organisms like that will, um, ticks I think, have the symbiotic relationship with these bacteria that will break down cellulose for them so they can get additional nutrients from the plants that they're eating. The next rung of the tier we have are secondary consumers. And these are carnivores and some omnivores that will eat the primary consumers. And these are uh, heterotrophic as well. And then even further up the chain from there, we have our tertiary consumers. And these are usually the top predators and they are carnivores and they will eat the secondary consumers. And then we have another very special and extremely important group called the decomposers. And these are organisms that break down once living material um, and basically recycle nutrients back into the environment. Without decomposers, there would be just a whole bunch of dead organic material just hanging around everywhere. They play a vital role in taking what's lost essentially due to death in the environment and cycling it back into the, the food chain. When looking at these trophic levels, we have a very important concept called the 10% rule. And this is the amount of energy that is transferred between trophic levels. So only 10% of the energy from food is, is available to be used for biomass production. So this is for you know, growth, reproduction, movement, et cetera, et cetera, just to keep you alive. The other 90% of potential biomass is actually lost. Um, it's lost as heat, waste, or lost in metabolism. And so I think this image here is actually a really good example of the concept. So if there is 100%, if this whole circle is 
of the possible biomass um, from this, this grass here. When this uh, small land mammal, I'm guessing like a mole or something, eats this grass, only 10% of that biomass is able to be used by this, this mole. And the same thing is said for when this mole is eaten by the snake. If this is 100% of the possible biomass for this mole, only 10% of it is able to be used by the snake for its own biomass. And it keeps going up from here. So you can imagine this system is very, very inefficient. And it's actually why the number of trophic levels in a food chain is quite limited. So an example that, um, to, to try to clarify this even more, let's say you, you are a 10 kilogram lynx, okay? The like, little cat animal. If you're a 10 kilogram lynx, to get to 10 kilograms, you have to eat 100 kilograms of small prey animals, so rats and, and rabbits, etc., whatever you can find, small birds. Uh, you have to have 100 kilograms of that just to make 10 kilograms of your own body mass. And to get 100 kilograms of the, that prey, they had to eat 1,000 kilograms of grass. So you can see how everything is multiplied by 10 in order to, to survive. So in this case, uh, this hawk would have to eat 10 times its biomass worth of prey to make its own biomass. Same thing with this rabbit, same thing with this, uh, this rodent here. We have to eat 10 times its biomass to make its own biomass. As you go up the trophic levels, there's less and less energy available, is what you, basically what we were just talking about. And um, this is why there's a limit to the number of trophic levels that you get in a food chain. And generally, just as a, a side note, many of you probably know this already, but in the, in the actual world, um, the, it, not, it doesn't happen as a food chain. There's food webs, right? So um, then the food web is consisted of various food chains. Different things eat different things. But in any case, this 10% rule still holds true, even if it's not a straightforward food chain. Only 10% of potential energy from prey is actually able to, available as biomass for yourself. And the higher up the food chain you are, the more food you have to eat in order to, to get that same amount of energy. Okay, now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about species interactions. So within an area, there are various species, and as those species interact, they actually affect each other's, um, affect each other's evolution. And so this is called coevolution. And there are various interactions that you can have, and we'll talk about each of these in more detail. One type is mutualism, they have commensalism, predation, parasitism, and competition. So mutualism. In this one, everybody wins, okay? So both species benefit. Um, some examples we have here are these little birds that will eat any leftover food and uh, bugs and anything that's gotten in this alligator's teeth. In this case, it benefits both uh, organisms in this relationship. The bird gets food, the alligator gets its teeth clean, which helps to protect it from disease and um, poor health conditions, right? Same thing with the bee and the flower. The bee gets the pollen so it can make honey. Um, it gets nutrients from the flower. The flower gets a pollinator because as the bee goes from one flower to the next, it takes some of its pollen and moves it onto the next flower and allows it to reproduce. So it's mutualism. And mutualism is very, very common in ecosystems. We wouldn't have the world we have without it. Um, it's probably the, one of the most common uh, interactions in an ecosystem. Next, we have commensalism. So this is where you have one winner and not really anyone loses out. Okay, so um, the images we have here are the examples of the sharks and the remora. So the remora get an opportunity to get exposure to food and less resistance while swimming. Um, when they're in contact with the shark, the shark is not really negatively affected by the remora. Um, some argue that in some of these commensalism relationships that there is some drawback for the animal that appears not to be harmed. Um, like it may cause more drag for the shark or things like that, but generally it's not being harmed. Um, it's the, the 
the effects of the other organism is more neutral, right? And same thing with this cow and this bird. These birds will hang around grazing animals as they're walking around. And as the grazing animals walking around, they're kicking up dirt and, and, and bugs. And these birds will hang around the grazing animals and pick off all those um, bugs that are hanging out in the grass that's been displaced by the grazing animal. In this case, the cow doesn't care that the birds are there. Um, it's not hurting the cow in any way, but the bird is benefiting from the cow because it's able to uh, identify more bugs because the cow has now displaced the dirt, right? This relationship is very one-sided, um, where one benefits, the other one doesn't benefit, not harmed, it's just kind of meh. Next relationship we have is predation. Predation is the one that I think most people love to watch most on TV. Um, so where you have one winner and one loser, right? Somebody is prey and somebody is is uh, the predator. We definitely um, have examples here of the ladybug and the aphid. Obviously the ladybug is the predator, the aphid is the prey. Um, and also it doesn't necessarily have to be always running prey. Um, in this image up here with the cows, the cow is actually would be the predator and the grass is the prey. So uh, it's a little less exciting than a cheetah and a gazelle, but this is actually predation as well. And in predation, it's an, actually an evolutionary arms race. The prey is always trying to adapt so it doesn't get eaten by the predator and the predator is always adapting to the prey to make it better at hunting prey so they don't starve to death. And so the prey then adapts again, right? So some common adaptations that we'll see in prey are two types. You can have physical and behavioral changes. Examples of physical um, adaptations are like the quills on a porcupine or bright coloring um, that will allow a, um, that deter actual physical um, interaction of the predator with the prey, right? If you're a porcupine, nothing is really trying to eat you that much. Um, or also if you have bright coloring, a lot of time in nature, bright coloring is uh, an indicator of something being poisonous. And so an animal is less likely, a predator is less likely to try to eat you. If they think that if they eat you, they're going to get sick, right? Some examples of behavioral modifications are like fighting back or having alarm calls. So th this is more like a Instead of your physical traits having been changed, your actual behavior is changed to try to help you survive. So if you're like uh, meerkats in the in the savanna and you develop a alarm call, that's a way of protecting yourselves as prey from predators. If you didn't have that alarm call, you might get eaten. As a result, predators also adapt. So some common things that we've seen in predators are resistance to poisons. So you'll see a lot of prey, like let's say you have a poison tree frog, its bright colors signify, hey, I'm poisonous. And they, they are indeed poisonous. If something eats it, they'll get sick. But some animals might have developed resistance to that poison. So they can eat that frog, right? So that's a way of adapting. Also, they uh, develop more acute sensory organs. So if, a, um, if an animal has developed better mimicry, maybe the predator will develop better hearing so it can actually hear it move a little bit better um, than it used to. And those predators are able to effectively get the prey. Um, same thing with mimicry. So we can see actually mimicry in both predator and prey where um, like in, pre in prey, we see it sometimes where they'll pretend to be like a leaf, like a leaf bug, or they'll pretend to be another animal that is poisonous to protect itself. And in predators, a lot of times they'll use mimicry to deceive uh, an organism. So we'll see uh, some turtles, their tongue will look like a, a worm or an angler fish, their uh, lure will draw in prey. And it's a form of mimicry to kind of disguise themselves for the prey and then that way the prey gets comfortable and ah, there you go. The next relationship we're going to talk about is parasitism. Uh, to me one of the most interesting types of interactions. This is also one example where you have one winner and one loser, right? But it's it's a form of predate it's a form of predation, but it's different. Whereas um, one organism will like heavily relies on the other organism to survive. And so we have the examples here of this uh, tick eating <laughs> the blood of a person. Um, 
ticks are parasites, right? They, they're they winning and you're losing. They're taking from you and they can actually give you disease, which definitely hurts you. Um, one of the more interesting examples to me out there in nature are these zombie fungi, right? The cordyceps. And that's actually what this image is here. This is a moth. You can kind of sort of see it. I'm high highlighting in blue. This is a moth. And all these projections here, these green projections or I'm, I guess I'm highlighting yellow. These projections here are actually all a fungus. And so it is a fungal parasite that attacks the brain of the insect and causes it to have behavioral changes that will help facilitate the spread of that, uh, that fungus. So parasites, they're very, very interesting, especially because they often have complex life cycles in order to get from a primary host to a kind of secondary host back into the environment. Um, parasites can be endo or ectoparasites. So as I mentioned, ticks, they're ectoparasite. They're on the outside of the body. Or you can endoparasites that will reside within the host. And an example of these are trypanosomes. Um, one that we all are probably familiar with is the trypanosome that causes malaria, right? That's a parasite that lives within the human bloodstream. Um, but there are very, very various uh, parasites. You've got tapeworms, you've got all types of hookworms and things like that that will reside within their host. Generally, parasitism, if you're a good parasite, good parasite, um, the relationship that you have with your host is long term because you don't want the host to die quick, then you die, right? The the interaction between a predator and prey um, and, par and predation is generally pretty quick. I'm going to catch you, I'm going to eat you. And parasitism, the parasite will generally stick with the host for a, a longer period of time in order to benefit. And like I mentioned, parasites generally have a more complex life cycle where um, and many of them have a two-part life cycle. So for example, um, some will cause have a primary host and then they'll have their kind of their target host. So they'll go from, let's say, water to a mouse. And then really what they want to get in is a cat. And like the case of toxoplasmosis, toxoplasmosis the um, parasite goes from the mouse, but it really wants to be in a cat. So it changes the behavior of the cat, I mean, of the mouse, to make them kind of more dangerous um, behaviors. So they're more likely to get eaten by a cat. And then once it's in a cat, that's where it wants to be, right? So that's a really complex life cycle for the parasite. Um, and But it's far more interesting to me than most life cycles. Finally, we have competition. So competition in this interaction, both organisms lose to a certain extent. So um, this occurs, competition occurs when you have two populations that are competing for the same niche or the same portion of the niche. And um, when you have two organisms competing for the same environment, for the same resources, they both can't coexist as they are in that area. So they must either both evolve or one must disappear. So we have two types of competition. We have competitive exclusion, and this is where the more efficient of the two populations wins, um, ter wins over the territory while the other population goes extinct. And we also have the second uh, of the examples is uh, resource partitioning. So this is where one or both of the organisms adapts to some other element of that environment, which allows them to coexist. So um, this image over here shows um, kind of both those examples. So looking at part one, part one, if you have both, uh, Organism A, population A and population B, this is two par paramecium species in two different test tubes, they both thrive. They both thrive just fine. They probably undergo this nice logistic growth curve. Everything's great for them. However, when you introduce them to the same test tube, you can get two different interactions that you might observe. One is that um, over time, one of the paramecium uh, populations will thrive and take over the entire test tube while the other one will die off or you can and that's you know competitive exclusion the uh, or you can see um this resource partitioning 
where both organisms will adjust to different elements of that environment um, in order for them to both survive in this same test tube. So this, in this case, this green paramecium has uh, adapted to only live at the air-liquid interface or closer to the aerobic zone of the test tube, while the second species uh, well, the second population is now living at the bottom half of the tube in the more anaerobic zone. And in both cases, some, someone loses, right? In both cases, both lose. Um, you lose members of your population, you slow down growth, especially in the case of resource partitioning. Um, it's not that they both win, but really they're not winning the whole thing, right? If, um, if they were able to have the entire test tube, they have all the possible resources. But in resource partitioning, really they're only getting half the possible resources. So it's kind of like a, a business compromise. I don't get quite everything that I want, you don't get quite everything that you want, but we're both alive and, and happy, right? The competition, a lot of times we like to think of it as head to head, uh, two rams fighting head, you know, with horns. It's not generally like that. Most uh, competition is actually indirect. So it's not two actual organisms fighting. It's more like over time, who's using more resources? Who's encroaching on more space? Who's producing more offspring, right? These are all indirect um, ways of competing with one another. Okay, with that said, we've reached the end of our kind of overview on ecology. Um, I would go ahead and recommend you read chapter 16, sections 1, 3, and 4 in your textbook, and then also chapter 17, sections 1, 2, 6, 9, and 11 through 14. Also, there's some cool crash course videos that I found that I've linked below. Um, I would recommend starting the first video listed here, which is part one of the ecology um, video they have at minute 14, uh, 14, at four minutes and eight seconds, 18 seconds, four minutes and 18 seconds, um, because that's kind of where I think the information really gets relevant to this lecture, and then watching all of the part two video. Excellent. If you have any questions, let me know. Have a good one.